Okay, welcome back everyone to the last session. So we have five talks, um, four in the sort of field of environmental uh, magnetism and uh, the first talk by Andy Biggin is the sort of hangover from the previous session. <laughs> uh, so, uh, hangover being the appropriate word, I suspect. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so Andy uh, and his hangover will be telling us about uh, low velocity provinces and signatures in the PDM magnetic field. Over to you. Thanks, Rich. Um, morning, everyone. And um, yeah, thanks to the whole Cambridge team for laying on this, this workshop. It's, uh, it's uh, very stimulating. So, um, yeah, like on all my submitted talk titles or something along the lines of please don't give me a talk, prioritize the early career researchers. Um, but yeah, I, um, here I am. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, and yeah, this, I'm going to be talking about something that has preoccupied me for much of the last uh, year. Those of you with good memories um, may yeah, find some of this familiar from actually magnetic interactions 22. Uh, so, large low velocity provinces and um, the signature in the paleomagnetic record. So, what are LLVPs? So there's been a lot of apologies for acronyms and I guess this one deserves one as well. Um, so you'll often see them referred to as LLSVPs. Um, so they're large, low velocity or shear velocity provinces, okay? And they're also seen in P wave records. So this is why I dropped the S. Um, but yeah, but it's a fairly dry descriptive uh, name for what is fundamentally a, a seismological observation. Um, so it's appropriate that they're, they're huge, so, you know, continental scale, largest, most dramatic features in the Earth's um, interior, uh, down at the base of the mantle, associated with um, uh, shear velocities that are uh, general like one percent or a little bit more lower. And um, uh, there's two of them. Uh, they are antipodal and they sit on the equator. Um, that is not a um, coincidence. Um, they are associated with geode highs. Um, and degree two geode high defines the minimum axis of inertia of the planet. If they were not on the equator, then true polar wonder would be moving them to the equator. Okay. Um, they're quite uh, distinct in character. So the one under Africa is kind of you know, monolithic and, and, and undercut to the, to the north. Um, and the one in the Pacific looks like it's basically been almost cut, cut in two, uh, possibly by uh, Triassic subduction, intra-oceanic subduction has been argued. Um, and yeah, as well as geode highs, they're associated um, with um, plumes observed in seismic tomography, um, also plume products at the surface, hotspots, large igneous provinces, uh, kimberlites, um, often argued to be from their margins rather than from directly uh, on top of them. They're also associated with the base of the mantle with these ultra low velocity zones. So these are you know, um, areas where seismic velocity is from very thin, a few kilometers or tens of kilometers drops to you know, um, tens of percent um, below average, probably associated with partial melt in the, in the lowmost mantle. Okay, but you may well ask, okay, so what actually are LLVPs? And the short answer is we don't know. Um, you will see them referred to in the literature sometimes as super plumes or thermochemical piles. That's a bit disingenuous, to be honest, um, because we just don't know, right? Um, so, um, yeah, these are kind of four ideas. Um, this is taken from a nice review paper by Ed um, So here we've got kind of, this is Barbara Romanovich's um, idea from a very high resolution seismic tomography um, models, but they're actually just clusters of plumes underlain by this, these giant ULVZs, these zones of, of, of partial melt. Um, similarly, these could all be combined into, into one big doming upwelling, um, but there's some also some evidence from normal modes and things that they are intrinsically dense. Uh, there's other evidence from seismics that they're, they're chemically distinct, um, in which case then, if they're dense, they sit on the bottom. Um, and um, yeah, maybe they rise and fall directly in the most stable. Um, so a few things in common uh, with these different ideas, that I think everyone agrees on, is they are where slabs aren't, okay? So that, that's almost, you could almost define them as that, the, the, the places where the, the slab graveyard isn't, okay? So, um, uh, and they're definitely associated with upwellings, you've got and plume products and things, um, and they're, they're hot. 
right? This is the thing, they, they are definitely hot. Everyone agrees on that. They might be dense, but if they're dense, they sit there at the bottom of the mantle, right on top of the really hot core, and they get hot, okay? Um, or they're just hot and they're rising up all the time, okay? Um, right, and this is very significant for the Earth's magnetic field because they're sitting right on top of the core. The, um, sorry, the dynamo is basically a heat engine. It's powered ultimately by the transfer of heat from the core uh, into the mantle. And this, these things, these giant hot blobs, are going to be influencing that. Okay. Um, so there's, why should we care about this, this signature, whether it's there or not, what it is? Um, the, these are VPs on the magnetic field. Well, it's going to give us insight into the dynamics that are going on in the core. Uh, it's going to tell us about stuff on the, the mantle side as well. And it's like, and um, yeah, that's you know, sort of the um, premise of, 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 deep, of the deep group is that, you know, paleomagnetism gives us this unique insight into the evolution of deep earth through time, okay? because we can use paleomagnetic record to go back, you know, millions, billions of, um, of years. There's also a good pragmatic reason as well to, uh, uh, to study these. Whenever you see these, you know, um, if you get, uh, so paleogeographic map, uh, maps, uh, pool plate models, right? Um, going back a billion years, right? These need some longitudinal constraint, and these come, I don't really have time to talk about it, I guess, um, uh, <laughs> but these come from um, uh, models about these LLBPs and their uh, signature on the, on the surface and so on. So yeah, one idea is that they're um, uh, completely stationary, so the, the, the Kevin Burke uh, version of Earth, and there's some, some terrible acronyms here, but um, the Tuzo Wilson and Jason Morgan, um, but the idea is they just sit there. For, for the whole of Earth history, and you can be using them as a, you can use the plumes from their margins as a, as a reference frame, and that's quite contrary then to, to an alternative view of the world by um, uh, Mitchell uh, et al., where the, these things are super plumes. They're governed by the, they're formed by um, uh, subduction around supercontinents happening in the past, and that they move actually ninety degrees um, every uh, six hundred million years or so. Okay, so first of all, we can ask, well, do we see, you know, we have very good records, observations of uh, present day magnetic fields, because I do receive their signature there. And the answer is mm, kind of, so we've, this is the um, field intensity at the, at the surface. This is a map of seismic tomography, the, the base of the mantle. And um, you don't see the, the LLVPs as so much as they're, they're brought out here by this, this, this color scheme, um, but what you, you Certainly seems as though you do see is a signature of the of the, the slabs, the where the LLVPs aren't, the girdle of subduction um, around um, around them. Okay, so in these high latitude flux lobes, um, with the field slightly weaker actually at the um, uh, at the poles. Okay, also you see this the you have the same signature in um, uh, magnetic field drawing reversal. So basically. Like the field dominated by the dipole, of course, and you kill the dipole and you see what's left over, and it's been argued, which late by um, uh, Colin Large and others in the 90s, um, I chose a summary figure from, uh, from Hoffman, Ken Hoffman's work, uh, that basically during reversal transitions, you get these density, um, these, these VGPs tending to fall in the same place where you see the highlight tube flip patches uh, today, uh, so in this girdle away from these LLVPs, okay, and um, in terms of uh, geodynamo simulations, and already for some time we've been able to reproduce this very qualitatively at least. So, um, Kusner and Christensen uh, showed that when you lay on, then when you overlay a heterogeneous um, uh, heat flow condition on their simulations, then you tend to get more VGPs happening um, where you've got the higher heat flow away from the LLVPs. Okay, so moving forward a bit in time then to, um, to 2019, this paper by um, John Mound and co-authors at Leeds. Um, this simulation and well, a whole range of simulations that they, they showed are non-magnetic, okay? So just um, convection uh, models, but run in a, an Earth-like parameter regime, um, a bit more uh, sophisticated than, than, than what's gone before in the sense that highly um, turbulent, so very strongly driven, um, but also very strongly rotationally dominant, uh, dominated as well, okay? Regime appropriate for Earth, but also with a highly heterogeneous heat flow boundary condition on them, okay? And 
we can see in this in this figure so this is the the uh, boundary conditions that they used so they just took a linear um extrapolation from uh, seismic velocity to uh, inversely to to temperature okay so where it's slower it's hotter um and what you see these so these green um iso surfaces are showing where the temperature is inverted okay nearly um the top of the core you get these regions that are right underneath the lbps where you have hot stuff at the top of the core where it shouldn't be right it's not going to participate then in the convection because it's less dense it's just going to sit there okay and um yeah so these were basically formed by the lbps where the heat flow was um was very low because the overlying mantle was um it was very hot the heat couldn't go anywhere this, this core fluid just sort of sat there hot okay and called they called them the regional inversion layers right now more recent than this they've, they've run full of magnetic simulations john and, and, um, and chris are very keen to get my hands on these and this is a snapshot of um of what two of them uh look like so we've got different Rayleigh numbers um here so quite strongly different Rayleigh numbers right um so both um vigorously convecting um so we talked about yeah there's so simon mentioned about sub adiabatic super adiabatic these are definitely super adiabatic overall uh, simulations but because of the heterogeneity they get this, this regional um stratification um but yeah so so really number much higher in, in this case on the on the right hand side q star defines the degree of heterogeneity so the um, maximum uh, the difference between the maximum and minimum is five times the average okay so it's so quite strong um, thermal heterogeneity. This is a radial flow just below the core mantle boundary. And um, you can see, if you look closely, you can see actually the velocities are much higher in this high um, the radial number case. Um, and you get more sort of fine scale structure. Um, but you get these big, these big holes we observe where, where the, these are the regional inversion uh, layers. And that has an influence then on the magnetic field. Okay. Um, as uh, basically two, two effects. So where you've got this. Um, this material that isn't moving, it's not contributing to the, to the dynamo for sure, but also it's highly conductive, so it's going to be a good magnetic screen, right? So it's screening what's being generated uh, below that. Okay. So our tool to look for the signature is going to be paleocircular variation. Um, I won't spend any time on, on this because uh, that was nicely outlined by, by Mary. Um, but yeah, we're going to look at be looking at um, these model G values as a simple quadratic fit to um, uh, to data. This is a compilation from the last 300 million years. And if we look at uh, VGP dispersion just in the um, in the low latitudes, uh, low latitude band, um, then what we can see is that there's very um, um, so this is just um, 30 degrees north and south of the equator. We see this longitudinal. Um, the varying pattern. Um, if we look in a, um, a paleomagnetic model, so if we, if we look at just the raw data from the last 10 million years, something there's too much noise to pick out. This is quite a subtle pattern. But if we take this model from the last 100,000 years and we just filter it, this did not, this was not constrained, this model at all, by paleocircular variation data in this way, most naturally. Um, but yeah, we see actually quite a striking similarity. Um, in, in terms of how that uh, varies with longitude, uh, but also actually the most striking for me of this is that the numbers are about right. These are all plotted on the same scale, right? All four of these models with the heterogeneity spontaneously produced Earth-like values of, of, um, of low latitude equatorial dispersion, which I found very striking. Okay, so as already mentioned, Mary covered that we have a one-to-one -one relationship between equatorial VGP dispersion and axial dipole dominance on average and um, uh, what we can see actually is that if we if we look at the the vgb dispersion plots uh, over very long time scales so we get a lot of a lot of dispersion in the dispersion over the last 300 million years compared to earlier in the crew cambrian record but the average numbers come out at identical right so no evidence here for long-term changes in the uh, um, polycircular variation, which means the average dipole dominance also quite similar. Okay, so rarely this very dipolar, rarely this very non-dipolar, more or less like this. Okay, so big question is how's how's that been held stationary for all um, for all this? And there's a clue if we look at all of these models, um, these running this very low Ekman number regime uh, with the um, or 
So over here, we've got the low convective figure. Over here, we've got the high Rayleigh number. Um, we've got homogeneous ones here without any um, heterogeneity place on. And then these are the ones with the um, peak flow heterogeneity. Um, and what we see is um, they're all pretty good, giving Earth-like values of, of paleosecond variation, except for this one, the high Rayleigh number. Without the heterogeneity on it, forces the, the model just goes crazy. It goes non dipolar, it, it's reversing um, like crazy here, and the, the, the um, paleocyclic version is like nothing we've seen. But exactly the same model, but with the heterogeneity on, okay, um, and that suddenly starts behaving itself well. So, um, okay, so to show most models do not achieve this when they run at higher Ekman number. This is the Earth-like um, golden zone here. And you can see that many of these models do not enter this zone, but even if they do, you increase the Rayleigh number a little bit and they, they leave it again, okay? By contrast, if we're running these ones at the, the lower Ekman number without the, the heterogeneity, heterogeneity, then um, we, um, yeah, they follow the same trajectory. We completely lose this, this earth like behavior as increased Rayleigh number. With it, they are locked into the earth like zone. So, this, I'd argue, then, is this effect of this, um, the heterogeneity then tending to stabilize the magnetic field over these very long time scales. And um, yeah, so we just we did a further analysis. So, thanks to Yael for this. This is her December, was um, basically just, just the pure screening effect. Take other simulations with homogeneous boundary conditions and the slack on the screening effect of the, the regional inversion um, lenses and see what happens to the, um, to the signal. And this is what we're going for. This is GGF 100K. And um, what you can see in every case, we slightly suppress the, um, the paleocyclic variation at low latitudes, which is what we want to do because these are all a bit too high. And we introduce this kind of sinusoidal. Um, event. So the screening event is not sufficient on its own. It doesn't fix all of them, but it does, it helps make things better. So other heterogeneity at high latitudes also playing a role. And this is my summary slide. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, time, still time for one or two quick questions. Thanks. So you showed the plots that had Q is zero and then you demented Q is two point three and Q is five. Mm. And you from my eyes, Q is two point three and Q is five, the kind of variation pattern you're seeing looks kind of similar. So yes. do you know is it that kind of step function at some point this kind of energy just switches on and then what's the same? And so what is that? What's what's the minimum? Yeah, we don't know. Um, because um these those six, these six are all right. I'm afraid, and I have asked to run some more, but it's like these things take months on of Archer time, so you know, the supercomputer, so they're very, very expensive to run. Um, so I've been told by. Of course, an implication of this is that those LS LLSVPs are being stable for. Well, <laughs> yeah, so, so <laughs> Trump likes this. It's yeah. a really great to you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it, it, not necessarily. What I would uh, just for the time for this, it suggests that um, low latitude um, peak flow has been suppressed over geological time. Whether it has to be those two things staying stable, that, that would do it. But you know, they could be moving around. You know, they could be fluxing on on. Hundred billion year time scales, and that's responsible for the variations in the you know the, in the reverse frequency and so on. But yeah, on average, we need we need hot things at the equator. Yeah, based on that. For those who aren't familiar with this, Kevin Burke actually thought they were primordial form oh. from the moon form of impact. <laughs> Any uh, questions online or, or in the audience? It's not. Then um, thanks, Randy, again.